Well, he was named the funniest teenager in Chicago in 1987. That's not bad considering the city's population was around 2.7 million back then. Hal Sparks is funny, but he's also fascinating. He speaks Mandarin Chinese yeah. and has studied martial arts for decades. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. It's cool to have him in Omaha tonight performing at the Funny Bone. Hal, good Hi, to Hal. see you. Hey, ni hao. I'm just <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you. You are one um, of the most yeah. fascinating people. I yeah. didn't realize. You I just thought you were Mandarin? funny. Mm -hmm. well, what can you What can you say? Well, I just did. What did you say? I know, but that was short. anything. I mean, just conversational. Yeah. It's it's fairly you know. Um, when you study music, it's actually easier to pick up a tonal language like Chinese than if you don't. But as a comedian, you imitate. So like my, my Chinese accent is, I sound like I'm from Beijing. So when I meet someone from Beijing, like I, I, when I would travel in China, they didn't know who, they wouldn't know what country I was from. Usually they can guess based mm -hmm. on how you're screwing up their language. Right, right, right. They can so, tell you're an American speaking Mandarin. Yeah, or, but but, you. or European yeah. or something. And they go, Nishinaliren, which means where are you from? And I go, Nitsai, Tsai, Tsai, guess. And they go, Bujada, I don't know. And uh, I'd go, Tsai, Tsai, like that. And they go, mm, Ugoren, German, Dilguoren, Russian. Like yeah. uh, they go through a bunch of um, different, you know, Adaliren, Australian, something like that. And, and I go, no. And I go, uh, I'm American, and they go, <laughs> which means but, no. But is there something about the way you learn Mandarin that you, you were able to abandon yeah. the American accent? How in did Mandarin? you learn? The books and CDs mostly. Um, really? Yeah. I didn't have a teacher. Um, I'd used a tutor for a while um, for stuff that I couldn't find in books. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I just loved it. And my, my Kung Fu instructor was from Beijing, and so out of respect for him, I started picking up the That's, That's where, that was the catalyst yeah. that for was you. The catalyst, but right. then, then comedy, right, I read that it was instant for you. From the moment you got out of high school, you knew this was your destiny. Before, I, mm. when I went into high school, arguably. I, and I, I started touring when I was, you know, as soon as I got out of high school regularly. And, but at 15, I was doing stand-up. Mm -hmm. so, How were yeah. you so sure? Because at that, I mean, it wasn't at that age. We've all been there. You're not sure about a whole lot. So how <laughs> did you know that professionally what you wanted to do? I, I, mm -hmm. Well, I think it was because I, I grew up on comedy records, and I would quote comedy records to my friends and all that kind of stuff, and I loved it. But I didn't understand it was a job. I didn't understand you could make a living doing it. Or it was mm -hmm. uh, to to me, a comedy album was like birdsong. Like somebody had just found a guy at a party <laughs> making jokes, and he just he just was funny. So they right. mic'd him for a while, right, right, right. and they're like, "We got we recorded this guy. And he's hilarious, and he didn't even know like right. that kind of thing." I didn't realize until I got to Chicago that it was like a job that had tiers of success. There, there was a ladder to it. You started out basically interning by doing sets for free. You'd open, you'd feature, you'd headline. There were ways, you know, middle ground in between. Mm -hmm. There were specialty gigs that you could build mm -hmm. out. And it's just like any other kind of job tier. And, and once I realized it was that kind of structure, I was like, I, I can do that. Yeah, okay, it was on. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, around here, they just got a new football coach, and they wanted to get a coach with experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that's how you, re you can relate it to these. It's like any other profession. The more experience you have, the better you get yeah, at it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and stand-up specifically is a time game. Uh, every other art, you can practice without anybody there. You can practice singing with a coach in a room for a long time and then unleash what you do onto the world, and you will trust that it is good. Yeah. You might have to learn a little bit of stage fright, but it has right. nothing to do with your craft. Right. Same thing with painting. You can paint in a room forever mm -hmm. until somebody discovers the paintings and likes them. You can write music, you can uh, write scripts, you can act even in acting classes until such time as you feel comfortable to get on stage and then do shows. Stand up, you can only learn on stage doing it. It's the only way. You don't know if it's good until mm. you perform it. Yeah, you have to be cured on stage. And un unlike other jobs, you can't build any confidence beforehand. So you have to have two main characteristics to be a stand up, to really make it. Uh, Arrogance and stupidity are your two best friends, uh, and I'm not even close to what's kidding. What's funny is I don't get either of those qualities out right. of you in meeting you before well, this. Well, they transmute now. later into confidence. Oh, I do see. But that. in the beginning, before you know you can do it, mm -hmm. you have to believe you can do it to a crazy extent. You have to stand up in front of an audience and believe mm -hmm. that you can make them laugh before you've ever done it, and how which vulnerable, is absurd. How vulnerable do you That's feel so when you step up and do that? It's not at all, thing. because you're arrogant and stupid. That's the point. <laughs> That's you, have, you have to be so full of yourself <laughs> yeah. that it yeah. doesn't even factor in. Otherwise, they'll see that you're nervous and it will fall apart. And you'll blame the act of stand-up for how you feel as opposed mm -hmm. to what you were conveying to the audience, which is that you're nervous. But yeah. you've got fans now, not just uh, grown-ups like us, but Lab rats, oh, yeah, right? to have, great. To have the, the, the kids of the parents who've been coming to your shows right. well, who are now your fans too. That's got to be a cool it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
it's it's really beautiful. Like the it just being able to go from a show like Queer as Folk to Lab Rats is, is just as a career arc is an amazing yeah. accomplishment. I'm very lucky that that worked out that way. But it's also a lot of fun. I mean, it's it's a joy to do it. Mm -hmm. It looks but, like that's the case. Yeah, but VH1, I love the '80s. Right. That's when you that, that's for among your people. credits. Sure. For a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, what do you love about the '80s? Is it still are the well, 80s I went through still puberty in the 80s, and I think you're hormonally <laughs> locked to whatever period that was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, the example I would give is my grandfather always used to wear a, uh, like a sailing hat, uh, like a captain's hat, and a vest all the time, like this tan vest over a white short sleeve button down shirt. And I, I couldn't understand why he dressed like that. All the, it was just ridiculous. <laughs> like he had a boat, that's fine. And he was in the <laughs> army, and that's fine. But he. He dressed kind of like that all the time. I couldn't figure out why. And yeah. then I realized, when I looked at old pictures, that my grandfather, when he was young, kind of looked like Humphrey Bogart. And that's probably how he met girls <laughs> when he was in the so service. Right, right, yeah, right, right. Sure. and yeah. it worked. And so you stick with what works for you. A lot of people just stick for the, with the look mm -hmm. or the feel that worked for them during that time. And they try to maintain a version of that as yeah. they move along. Right. And, and I just, uh, I'm in love with every decade I've been a part of. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm just, Sometimes I'm panicked by the beauty of life. I'm just, it's, it's overwhelming how much cool stuff there is and how many great mm -hmm. human interactions there are. And it's just, you get intoxicated by it. And the 80s were particularly fun and silly mm -hmm. because we all thought we were going to die all the time. You forget that everybody thinks like, Thinking you're going to be blown up is a new thing yeah. that started in right. 2001. The bomb one. shelters, I remember in grade yeah, school. Yeah, all that stuff. Like, and so there was something nice that 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 fear balanced with big shoulder pads and bright clothes and Cindy Lauper. It was kind of hysterically <laughs> ironic. I wish time. the Price is Right didn't start in six minutes because we could talk to That's you. That's so forever. true, anyways. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, tickets this, to see how this. you've got one night to do it, and that's it. So the bone phone's on the screen now. You could also go to FunnyBoneOmaha.com. And I'm uh, kidding because I love Drew Carey. Yeah, I was gonna say he's, he's a good friend. He's, a, like he's a decent too. guy. He gave me a copy of Success University, Og Mandino's book, a long time ago, and he hands it out to everybody. So if you, uh, this is for Drew. Buy, do yourself a favor, <laughs> buy Og Mandino's book, Success University, and read it all the way through. Thank you, Hal. You can thank good Drew. Stuff. Thank you for coming. We got to run. Yeah, nice Enjoy to meet your stay you. in Omaha. All right. Um,